Hello, and welcome to Masters with Masters. These sessions bring together leaders and experts who discuss key issues pertaining to NASA, the missions, the programs, and the projects that we do. Today is a special session that's focused on big data, what it is, how are we using it, what are some of the future challenges and issues, and we have leaders from NASA to discuss that. One of the things I also want to mention is that we're fortunate this session will be live streamed, so hopefully you're watching it right now on your computer or system, and we'll be taking questions and answers. And you should see in the lower right-hand corner a small bubble, a thought bubble, so anytime you have a question, click over there, submit it, and we'll be pulling your questions in throughout the session. This is a session that is a joint between a lot of organizations. Uh, Ed Hoffman, I'm the Chief Knowledge Officer. We're also working with the Chief Information Office as well as the NASA Engineering Safety Center. So it pulls together a lot of different communities. We have two distinguished uh, leaders uh, in big data, John Sprague and Brian Thomas. John is the Deputy Technology and Innovation Division and end user architect at NASA within the Chief Information Office. John is responsible for the architecture of the largest information technology portfolio that affects over 60,000 scientists, researchers, and academic partners. As the end user services domain architect, he develops roadmaps and architecture artifacts, utilizing a team of 11 center enterprise architects around the agency, previously led the Bring Your Own Device, very creative. He also had a career uh, over 20 years in the Air Force. Welcome, John. Thank Looking you. forward to talking with you. And we have Brian Thomas, who is a data scientist who's been at NASA headquarters for uh, a few months at this point, but he has more than 20 years of experience supporting or leading scientific, technical research, data analysis, and scientific programming. He's also worked at different organizations, including NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, the University of Maryland, and the National Optical Astronomy Observatory. Welcome, Brian. So this is a, it's a hot issue. It's probably one of the, uh, the most important issues. We see it on articles, on newspapers. Uh, what is the big uh, deal about big data? And uh, one of the questions we started discussing at the, at, at the start is how did you get involved with uh, your interest in big data? How did you get to the point? I'll start with, with, with you, John. You started at the Air Force. You had a career. Now you're, you're doing what you do around technology tools and big data. So how did you get here? So um, I've retired Air Force 22 years. Uh, I've worked a bunch of help desks. I did six help desks, the last one being Homeland Security. I helped set up there their latest help desk, and uh, that led me to uh, Enterprise Service Desk here at NASA, needing some help. Came in and helped do that project. Um, so to me, uh, how did I transition that over to uh, big data? It's, it's kind of like the, the title of your, your program here, what's the big deal with big data? Um, I heard about it and I was interested in what it was, so I went and took a, uh, a six-week MIT course uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of like the, I've heard it's the gold standard for that. It's an online and it's, a, you know, I do it after work uh, every day and got through that program and I learned a lot and I was even more psyched and more interested in big data. So I, I went down that path and decided to try to uh, see how that applied to what we were doing. NASA's been doing big data for, to be honest, decades. Um, they just, maybe we didn't have that term at the time. And so what was the course I'm interested, at MIT that you took? It's just big data. It's the MIT big data online course. And okay. you know, people can Google it and find it pretty quick. And uh, so you had that, that interest in, in terms of working, obviously, with technology and with systems. And so after Absolutely. your military career, decided to, to look and at And after that. doing the uh, ESD project, the Enterprise Service Desk project, right. I was then the end user service exec, uh, dealing with all the uh, equipment out there uh, for IT all the personal equipment, the people that use the laptops right. and printers and all that. And then I moved on to the Enterprise Apps Service Exec. So I worked down with the folks down at the NEAC, the NASA Enterprise right. Application Competency Center at Marshall, a uh, great group of people, and we worked uh, very closely together taking care of all the apps for NASA applications. Right. Um, and then moved over to where I'm at now in the Technology Innovation Division. And uh, I just, I got a wonderful job. Right. I, I love what I'm doing. And, 
these new things that, or at least new terms that come down the pike uh, like this, I get to investigate them and see how we can apply them at NASA. You get to have fun. And, it's fun. Uh, just in the introduction, we've covered uh, a number of things we want to get into. So, Brian, uh, you've had a, also an interesting career in terms of uh, uh, the work, the research uh, that, that you've done in terms of the science areas, and uh, now uh, you know doing you know big uh, data science. Uh, what is it? How did you get to the, this point where you joined uh, NASA uh, a few weeks ago? I guess and. Uh, what was that journey in terms of working your research and, and doing some of your, your contract work? And what led you to decide to, let me go to NASA headquarters to work this issue? Uh, well, I, I guess I would say that uh, I've been involved with big data for most of my career. And we, as John said, we didn't really have that term back then. But certainly investigating uh, science data involves uh, a number of paradigms which map directly into the big data problem set trying to understand diverse data sets and combine them, dealing with data that are so large that you can't bring them back to where you're at, having to be clever about the processing. Dealing with those kind of problems, I've always found that to be very enjoyable, fun. That's, for me, that is really what gets me up and, and really excited in the morning. So over the course of my career, I've dealt with a variety of these problems. I've done engineering research on these problems, done science that's involved these problems. And getting here to NASA is a very exciting opportunity for me because it's finally a chance to really pull all these disparate threads together into one job. You know, instead of tackling one aspect of the problem, now I'm having to deal with it uh, all at once and really having to worry about how it's impacting the agency. Uh, so this is a really exciting opportunity. And also the ability to link it to, I know you're, you have a doctorate from, I think, Penn State. In That's terms correct, of yes. Science, you're able to link you know, what you're looking to do in terms of your career to the use of tools and technology. Absolutely. I, you know, John's coming at this from a sort of a user standpoint, and, but you know, my, my primary interest is in the science and engineering data and how we can enable that uh, next generation, the 21st century science and engineering that I know uh, to some extent, we're held back by the big data problems. So for me, this is a really exciting area to work in. And, and uh, Brian is actually not new to NASA. He was at NASA before at Goddard. Yeah, so I, I have an appreciation of the culture. It's, it's my first civil servant position, however. Yeah, we were talking, as we do before this, for, for a while, the enthusiasm, the excitement, uh, in terms of both, both of you talking about how you love what you do. Um, so we've been looking to do a discussion around big data, you know, probably for a while. Uh, I've been talking to Deborah Diaz and, and others about this, and so we've, we've final, finally done this or gotten started with this. What is big data? I mean, one of the things is how do people wrap their heads around uh, big data? You've been talking about NASA's done it, you know, before. It's been called other things. Uh, is there big data, you know, and small data? Is there things that are structured and unstructured? What is it that uh, that big date is about, particularly from a NASA standpoint. John? So um, first I'll, I'll just describe what big data is a little bit. Um, big data is, uh, it, it actually the term came from, it was coined by two folks out at Ames Research Center. So uh, that's an amazing wow. fact back in the 90s. Um, and what they did is, at the time they had gigabytes of data which they couldn't process on their equipment at the time. So they called it big data in one of their scientific papers, and it got published out. Remember who it was? Uh, I, I don't know the, okay. the two names, but uh, one of them's still working at uh, Goddard, so it's it's kind of funny. Okay. That, I, I'm sorry, at uh, Ames Research Center. Okay. So it's kind of funny how that worked out. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I also met with a, a person named De Doug Laney, who uh, uh, works out at uh, Gartner, and he's the one that coined the term the the three V's: velocity, volume, and variety. And uh, you know, and that kind of describes big data in a nutshell, volume being, you know, we've got large, large, large amounts of data coming in. Uh, variety being, there's all these different formats and it's really hard to put them together to really make sense of it and be able to, to analyze the data. And then um, volume, variety, and uh, velocity. It's coming at us from all these probes and, and all the different devices that we have on, on the network. It's coming in so fast, right. it's, it's hard to try to get it uh, to a point where you can uh, process it real time. And um, obviously, so one of the things we talked about is you're looking at things from, a, I guess, an end user standpoint as part of, part of your title and, and, and the applications. And so, Brian, from the standpoint of, you get scientists and engineers 
how do they how do they benefit from from big data? All right, well, that's a great question, Ed. Um, basically, so there's a lot of aspects to this. Uh, the there's only so many engineers and scientists that first let me start here. There's only so many engineers and scientists that we're going to be able to hire. You know, if you right. if you might want to plot it out against time, it might. If we're optimistic, it's kind of a, a shallow linear a function. It'll increase over time, but we can't expect a super dramatic increase. If I were to then plot out the amount of data that we're going to be getting from our engineering systems, which are growing ever more complex, and our science data instruments, which the, the focal plane detectors are, our detectors are going up by a, the larger and larger areas. So that, that function looks like this, right? So you, you have a right there sort of is the core of the problem is how are you going to carry out your mission when you're just essentially being deluged with data? And so immediately you're presented with the issue of scalability. You just cannot continue business as usual uh, and get the job done. So you really have to start thinking more cleverly about the problem and choosing different approaches. And so that, that's really at the core of the problem. So partly it's an issue of what they call cognitive overload. There's so much information, there's so much stuff. How do we make the right decisions? How do we set priorities? Yeah. How do we make sure we're using our time and understanding what we need to, to understand and, turn, and that, that would be key for scientists and engineers? I, I think that's, one way, that's a good way to put it. Um, I, I always go back to a, a quote, and I can't think of the, the person who originated it, but it's something like you, you can have data without knowledge, but you can't have knowledge without data. And so that really gets to the, the core of the issue is you can wind up with so much data, but if you're unable to analyze it, you essentially cannot take any action. You, you have no real information you can act on. And so that's really the, 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 the meat of the issue there. And so when I think of doing, when I talk about let's do 21st century science, we're talking about trying to, to get a hold of all of these big data that are coming in and being able to analyze them um, and dealing with the three Vs. And so th the next generation, uh, the Nobel Prizes, in, I feel, from my point of view, are going to come from being able to solve these problems adequately. You know, uh, in astronomy, the area that I come from, um, sort of the two big domains, uh, the two big issues right now are how are we going to understand the time domain? And that essentially is a big data problem because we want to be able to combine data that are occurring now, data that we've taken in the past, combine them together, and of course, as missions evolve, the standards change. We have to remember what those standards were like. We have to be able to get at those data. Where are those data now? Right. And another aspect in astronomy is being able to understand the complete astrophysical process. These objects in space can have very complex astrophysical processes backing them, and if you look at a very narrow window, say one mission is only capable of looking in the optical spectrum. That's the spectrum in which we all can see in, in human vision. And another mission might look in a different wavelength, say X-rays, uh, gamma rays, and so forth. If you only choose data from one mission, then you're seeing a very narrow window into an astrophysical processes, and you can easily be misled. It doesn't take much to lead, mislead very smart people with, with minimal amounts of data. So to understand the whole process, you need to take observations from across the entire spectrum. And this gives you much better insight. And so this is a big data problem because, again, you've got multiple missions, perhaps different standards if things aren't structured correctly, and a difficulty of combining these data together, as well as getting access to these data. So uh, in, in NASA data, uh, as good as our satellites are, I think there's always a compelling um, use case for going outside of NASA, say, to ground-based observations to other observatories outside of NASA, and to combine those data. It can only improve our analysis and right. improve the science that we return back. Um, so let me see if I, in terms of what, what both of you um, are doing. So one of the things we, we do research in, obviously, you know, hundreds, thousands of areas. One uh, example is astrophysics processes and, and collecting research, and there's a lot of data that has been collected by NASA and outside of NASA in the past. There's also data being collected now and in the future. Part of what big data tries to do in terms of a thought process as well as in terms of tools is to say this data is really most primary, most critical, and indicating that there's other data that it, it, it's not helpful, and then 
you kind of lay out some of the methods for thinking about that, and John, you help with some of the tools. Is that accurate at a high level, or am I oversimplifying we, it? Or? We work as a team, uh, first right. of all. We've got uh, experts all, all over the place, and uh, matter of fact, to, to try to bring that together, we have a, a big data working group that we've started and uh, meets the uh, second Thursday of every month. Um, we also do big data, big thinks twice a year. And uh, the next one's at Goddard, uh, the October 20th through the 27th. What is big data, big thinks? So that's where we get together and we, we don't just say, hey, show me everything you're doing and I'll show you what I'm right. doing. And, and it's just a, just a one-way kind of information. We sit down and we break into working groups um, we have different segments that are brought in. We even bring in a little bit of industry. Uh, we, we try to, right. you know, try to focus on uh, some of the challenges and problems at NASA, and and that's where we put all the brains together and try to figure out. All right, so what tool would work best? Uh, what team would work best? Um, uh, should this be done at uh, one of our HPCs, high performance computing centers, uh, like the one out at Ames Research Center, which is one of the top ten in the world and then the one at uh, Goddard, and then there's others out there uh, scattered among the centers. Um, so using the tools and, and using them to the best ability that we have. Right, and so together you, you come up, and with others obviously, it's a broad team involved, it's sending a strategy for how do we use resources that are you know, increasingly limited to be able to help the, the missions and the scientists and the engineers do the best research that they can with, uh, with tools that make sense, and pulling together a community to do that, right? That's what yeah. it takes, right. absolutely, because you're right, the, the budgets are always shrinking a little bit, right. and uh, you gotta make do with what you've got and try to do the best you can. So I think we're doing that. Um, and we're doing it in a, in a just a, to me, a, such a collaborative and awesome way. It's, it's, to me, it's impressive. Yeah. And so in terms of methodology, we're trying to establish a methodology, you can look at it as an approach, there's all this data that's out there. And I remember as a doctoral student, there's all this data and you kind of look just for something that would get you the results you're, you're looking for. The other way is obviously to say we have specific research questions or data questions and from that we move forward. It sounds like it's the latter that you, or, or do you do both? The well, you're looking, for, you're looking for at data. Me, but I, well, I would argue, yes, you would do both. Um, that there's no question about it. it look, you you go into the you go into the enterprise wondering you know can I answer my question and then I think one of the magic things one of the things that I'm certainly excited about and I would imagine most researchers are that unexpected moment. That's actually where the really exciting science is to me is when you know you may find the behavior that you expect and you may support the case the theory that you came out came to the data with. And that's great, but what really gets exciting is when you get this sort of little cluster of behavior off on your graph and you realize, I have no idea what that is. Right. That's where the real magic is. That's electric for me as a researcher. And I think, you know, big data tools really, you know, if you apply the right methodology, the right tools, then you can have more of those moments because, again, with the data deluge, the problem of combining the data, then it's all too easy to, you know, miss the really exciting stuff right. or not be, able, not be able to even get to it. You know, that's, that's the issue. And I think John had some ideas. About so, that. yeah, what are the thoughts in terms of methods or how NASA approaches this whole, this so, whole challenge? So, you know, we're, we're always working on that, and I think we're at a point where methodology is uh, something that uh, we have folks, team members out there that are doing different methodologies, and when we share those, then we, we get that aha moment and really can work on it from there. Uh, an example is uh, Sandeep Chetier out at Ames Research Center uh, right. is working on a project called EVA, um, Extravehicular Activities Project. Right. And that was really pulling all the data together. And so the methodology that he's come up with is now being looked at by other mission directorates as he shared what he was doing uh, with, with a, a large team of a great folks down at uh, Johnson. And I think that uh, the folks that have seen what he's doing are very interested in replicating that throughout the rest of uh, some of the mission directorates. Right. And we're starting to get calls and, and queries about that. So uh, talking methodology, you know, we've, we're already starting to form some, and, and I think that's where uh, 
uh, we'll get the most bang from our buck down the right. road. It also sounds like a outcome of this is that as people work their big data, as it's shared, as it's communicating, it's also building relationships. So what may have been, this is my project, and no one knew about it, now it's becoming more of a, of a community. Is that fair also that it's, it's building these relationships? Absolutely, and when we get together for our Big Data Big Thanks or our, our monthly uh, working group, right. that's where we're, we're getting that. Because we get a new member and they'll come in and go, wow, I, I just finished this and, and I did it, it was great. And then I just heard you had done something similar and, and you can compare notes and we, we all get to hear that on the, on the calls and, and go, wow, um, I'm having the same exact problem. I, I need to yeah. figure out how you did that. What tool did you use? What people, what contract, what, right. you know, I want to know everything. So it's cre creating a collaboration and excitement, a community of folks who are moving out on this kinds of stuff. Yes. I think we could do even more, actually. I, I, I would really like to see a situation where, I mean, if you think about it, big data, it's not a problem of big data itself, but when you think about the fact that these data are uh, scattered all over NASA, maybe even outside of NASA, that the expertise itself, NASA is already sort of a scattered uh, agency, as it were, but it's, we're no longer really in a situation where experts are clustered together in one spot. So we have to, these meetings are an excellent way to address the issue. But I think we could actually seek solutions where we can create virtual collaborations across NASA. And we can look for means or uh, development of our infrastructure at NASA such that it makes it easy for people to form these collaborations and find one another. And so definitely our office is working in that direction. We, we have a website, NIAM nasa.gov where we're essentially trying to gather resources and researchers we're working with the knowledge management folks to try to develop a registry uh, an intelligent registry where people enter their interests and their capabilities and that it would be searchable but I think we can do even more than that in trying to basically engineer social networking uh, type of technologies right. around our data our data sets interesting. I think this would be exciting uh, in terms of the website what was the first letters niam and i'm which is i have to admit i'm a really terrible speller NIAM. it's n i a m dot nasa dot gov okay. n i a m and it's an internal NASA. website for okay. internal so NASA. NASA. nasa yeah so if you're right. outside of the nasa firewall you'll have a hard time reaching it but. okay and maybe that's something to talk about later is how since most of our work is done with industry and a large part with international with universities are there strategies to you know how do we all come together um, but going back, so one of the things I'm impressed by and, and, and surprised is I, it seems like big data is big, uh, no pun intended, but from the standpoint of impacting the programs and projects. Uh, is it like a percent of missions that we have? Is it starting off? Is it like 10% are involved where you expect that in 10 years all projects and all missions will be doing this? Or is there any sense of... I would, I would hate how to quantify it. I mean, we have many interesting research activities, large and small. It's uh, happening at every center. It oh, it's, like. I, I'm, I, I, maybe I would subscribe to that statement, yes. I, I think right. you could probably find big data problems across every center, right. uh, across every mission and activity. I, I'm not so sure. However, you know, it's, I don't think we're ever going to necessarily solve it. Right. When I look at the trends of instrumentation and our engineering projects, which are clearly not becoming less complex right. you know so yeah. the amount of data is going to continue to scale um, well I mean I would hate to say the disadvantage dis, uh, as a disadvantage to the number of engineers and scientists but I mean that's the challenge and the opportunity right, right? and I, I don't see that going away so we're going to have an evolving um, challenge uh, the solutions that we come up with today will be great for today, but then I think we'll have to come up with new ones uh, in the future. I think there's always going to be a challenge here. Lifetime employment. That sounds like it's <laughs> well, that, that's great to hear. Good, good you know. Growing good industry. Yeah. yeah. I also, I wonder, would you see down the road that every major program would have to have a data scientist or a big data person, because it, or is it mostly really geared towards the science engineering part? Or, oh, I these are just... It seems like it's going in the direction because everyone's dealing with the issue of complexity and uh, overload and so much information. And how do you get clear priorities for where we're going to be doing things and how we move forward? And, and that, that whole ability to have an analytical uh, 
uh, ability of that, a quantitative sense of it. It seems like it's going there. I don't know if that's your vision or... Well, I think, I, th I think certainly in NASA we have spheres of excellence already. And as John has mentioned, uh, for decades, areas of NASA have definitely tackled successfully big data problems. There's no doubt of that. On the other hand, I think there is also no doubt that there are areas of NASA which have uh, less expertise. And so really the challenge at this point is how do we uh, spread that expertise across the agency and get to those areas which could really benefit the most. And I would hate to characterize what will happen in the future or what we might even be calling data science right. in a decade. But I, I would agree that you know, these techniques, um, these approaches, NASA as an agency can absolutely benefit by spreading it wider, casting a wider net. And I think that by and large, many areas of NASA which currently do not take a sort of data science approach will. Right. And I to. wanted to add one on there that um, we did uh, during uh, several of our working groups ask uh, around for the folks that are, that pr procure and, and uh, you know, handle and use and, and monitor uh, the data out there in the different mission directorate areas and in centers uh, for data stewards. So, yep. and we've got a, a listing of data stewards so that if we hear, oh, uh, somebody wants to know more about a certain data set, we know exactly who to go to. That's not something we had uh, even a few months ago. Oh, yeah, thanks for that point, John. I, I also want to, uh, that reminds me that uh, one of the things that we're beginning to push on is a data fellows program, uh, which is going to be at several different levels of expertise to try to engage uh, both in academic and industrial industry levels to try to bring expertise that we may not have right now into NASA so that we can learn from it firsthand and that we can also show the problems that we have here at NASA back to academia and industry you know, through this sort of uh, program of engagement. And I think that's a, it's similar to, uh, to the data stewards. I mean, this is another way that we can help to solve the problems that we're having. So getting more challenges. people involved yes, and, uh, exactly. and, and, and pulled in. So, I'm sorry. so we, we're starting to get questions okay. uh, from some of the <laughs> folks that are watching, so I should probably get to that. And, and for those of you, again, who are watching this on the, the live stream, there's a bubble in the lower right-hand corner which allows you to to, to tap into and ask your questions. So here's a question pertaining to the amount of data. And it, uh, it says, you mentioned, I guess it's talking to Brian, you mentioned the importance of getting data from many places to get data to improve our analysis. Is there ever a point where there's too much data where it isn't helpful? And can you give an example? So I guess, uh, although I would think that's uh, the, the, the point is you want uh, uh, loads of data because that gets the big in the analysis. But is there ever a point where there's too much, or or how to handle that? Or I guess I'll start with Brian and if, if John, you yeah. have anything to. I, I think that's a great question. Um, I don't have it, since uh, I didn't know I was going to get this question. Right. I, I don't have an exact example, but I am aware that some of the missions that are beginning to um, approach reality do have an issue with telemetry in terms of the detectors that they have are producing so much data that it's impossible to take the raw data right off of the satellite and take it to the ground. And so one of the strategies is to essentially pre-process it on the satellite. Um, of course, the first thing you want to do is keep all the data. And so you seek some sort of compression, which is not lossy. Uh, I wish I had an example in front of me uh, that I could pull out exactly, but I seem to recall that there have been some missions face with the problem of having to use lossy compression, or uh, another neat way of going is to essentially do feature detection on your data set, which gives you great uh, compression, but it really winds up tailoring the science or engineering to just the features that you can pull out and maybe things that are a little bit related. And so, yes, that's absolutely a challenge. Okay. Um, and here's a, uh, a question that's directed more towards John, uh, they write. Can you give us an example of how big data influences NASA missions that most listeners can relate to? So uh, the work that you're doing uh, in these areas, how it, how it has had an impact on specific NASA missions, programs, projects, engineering? Well, uh, I'll bring up the, uh, the EVA one as a, uh, a very specific example. It's, it's finishing phase one right now, getting ready to go to phase two. And that's the extravehicular activities one. Right. And that's uh, if it goes back to a problem that started 
back when uh, we had one of the helmets uh, out on uh, one of those astronauts who was doing a spacewalk, and it, it gathered a leak. Right. It had a leak in it that started uh, really causing a problem. Well, they went back to look at all the data at, about the helmet, and it became a, a, a kind of a big data or just a data management problem. If you looked at, uh, there, was, there was some data stored on Excel spreadsheets, some was st stored in databases, some were just in, in filing cabinets. And there was no easy way to pull all that together. So to solve that, they came up with a, a, a tool that could make a, uh, a model that you could spin around and you could pick any part of the suit, click it, and drill down to the point where you could see the, the screw in the back of the helmet that held a visor on or something and tell um, who, who put the screw in there, when they did it, what was the torque, uh, what are the specs for that, um, you know, the manufacturer, all that data along with, um, you know, who was the last one to touch it. And, uh, you know, now you've got all that at your fingertips. And that's an amazing change right. from maybe taking a week or, or two or three or even longer to try to gather some data. Now you've got it at your fingertips, and you can really drill down. So that's a, that's a huge change. And we're starting to get, right. you know, inquiries from other programs and missions wanting to do the exact same thing, to use that kind of a tool and, and the expertise that we've put together um, working with the mission directly uh, to get that done. So um, I, I know right. two or three calls we've already gotten in the last couple of months. That's a, yeah, that's an amazing example yeah. because it cuts into, you could see how it would impact um, costs, obviously in terms of time, the ability to maybe get an answer in a day as opposed to 10 days. Yeah. Uh, but also even more important, the, uh, the issue of safety. Exactly. Uh, you have an astronaut and dangerous situations, and uh, people can have the, the, the data with them so that they you, can you see You don't have happening. weeks. Right. You know, minutes, right. minutes count. Yeah, that's a, that's a tremendous uh, example. Um, you had brought up uh, previously one of the issues of the, the three Vs, uh, volume, velocity, and variety. And um, can you maybe describe that? Um, I'm, I'm learning as I'm talking here with you. It's, it's a concept I haven't heard before. So how does that relate to the work you're doing? And is one aspect of that most of a, a greater challenge than another for NASA? Um, it, that's, a, it's a very, that's a very good question. It's a very complex question because all three Vs have their own problems, their own issues. I would have said uh, in the past, uh, first of all, NASA is so big we have a, a problem maybe in each one of those areas at different times. You know, volume might not be a problem for, for a certain um, project, but then the variety of the data that's coming in might be. Right. Um, what is volume, for example? So, what, so volume would be that there's so much data coming in that yeah. it's hard to process. You need right. to go and put that data all in a, in a city storage-wise in, in maybe a high-performance computing center and have it sit there. Then you bring the tools to it, and you run the tools right in there where you've got a lot of memory. Um, so that's the, that's the volume part is to, is to be able to handle that much data, just unbelievable amounts. Right. Um, I, w I would have said volume would be, in general, would have been the problem in the past. But um, now that we've got areas where we can stick all the data, uh, the uh, variety used to be a problem. So velocity is, is like the last little problem that um, you want to be able to get the data as it's coming in and then process it right then. That, right. that might get you a, a very timely answer to something uh, as opposed to uh, taking you know, years and years of data and then and sticking it on a, a big server, more or less, and running it. So and, and NASA variety has, would be different kinds of, how do you Variety would be like the out. format that you bring the data in okay. or the way it's, the columns are set up in the, in the data. Um, you know, trying to get those to match up just right is not a very easy task. Luckily, the tools have evolved to the point uh, that that's less of a problem. Right. Uh, but it still might be a problem uh, depending on uh, w which part of, uh, you know, a mission directorate or a mission project that you're in trying to solve it. Yeah, I would completely agree. Um, there's all sorts of projects across NASA, and it's, you know, just a, a matter of which project you're looking at. Um, one of the more interest ones, interesting ones that I, I've come across recently at Kennedy Space Flight Center, um, the guys there, or sorry, the team there, was looking at trying to essentially integrate um, the interaction between the technician 
who might be out at the gantry doing work, uh, critical work, along with a sensor net of array of uh, cameras and gas sensors and whatnot that might be also on the gantry with an engineer who could be back at the blockhouse uh, interacting with the technician or actually a team of technicians who are out there at the gantry and then trying to integrate the information, uh, the technical specifications of the, the equipment that the technician might be working on and then also allow the engineer a view of the sensor arrays. There may be hundreds of sensors. This is just really impossible for any one human being to monitor adequately. Right. And then the question of making a sense of all of this information. And of course, if you had a gas alert or a smoke alert, is it a real one? How do we take action? That's a velocity issue. You know, how quickly can we get the information of the technician? What action can we take to get that person out of there? Um, so that problem would be sort of a velocity and a variety when all of the different sensors may have different formats and you need to um, get them into the same format so that you can have a uniform system that can understand them. There's not necessarily a, a volume problem there. But, and then we've touched on other problems such are volume problems. So that's just an example of two of the Vs coming into the four there and making it a big data problem. Right. Com complex issues. One of the things that someone was telling me actually just within the last week about an airline that gets, I guess, during a flight, there's so much information, there's so much data about what's working, what's not, uh, but it, it's so much data that they dump it. Uh, while if you collected that and could access it, you can make different projections, you can understand different dynamics, and so I guess that would be an issue of volume based on what you're, so this is how that plays. How do you deal with the data? How do you understand it? How do you get it in the right time frame? Right, These it's definitely volume, and, and that goes back to even uh, what Brian mentioned earlier, the satellites. You get so much data that you can't send it all down, so you gotta process it. And that's what the airlines are doing too. They're, right. they're processing it down and only giving the vital information that they need. And so, so what are some of boat. the, uh, within NASA, what are some of the, the key issues or challenges that you see uh, in, terms of, in terms of this area and the use of data and uh, you know, thoughts from there? And I know, Brian, you know, you've been with Goddard, so you've been part of NASA, but also you're coming on new, so you may have different ideas. So do you see certain things that are repeated patterns or are the, the greatest challenges that you're dealing with? You want to take that? Great, greatest challenges. Um, to me, the greatest challenges, uh, you know, kind of sometimes they go back to budget. Uh, you know, right. I, you know the, more, the more funds you have, the more t the bigger, bigger and better tools you can get and then uh, the bigger team you can get. So, um, you know, but that's a problem that's faced across not just mm. NASA, but all agencies right. and even companies uh, probably have that same exact problem. So, to me, uh, funding is always going to be an issue. But you got to find ways around it, and you got to find ways to do it cheaper, uh, better. Um, l luckily, um, we don't have a problem, or it's not a problem, is that people really understand what we're doing now. They're starting to. Right. Um, you know, I, I've got a great, we've got a great boss, uh, Deborah Diaz, as we mentioned earlier, uh, up the chain. Up, uh, we got uh, Larry Sweet, our CIO, right. and then um, Renee Wynn, uh, the, the uh, deputy CIO, are are just they get it, and and that's. Having that right. support makes uh, the, all the difference in the world. Good leadership is the, is exactly. the difference. Exactly. Good Absolutely. leadership. Uh, they, they, they fund us appropriately where we need to be. Um, and, you know, we'd always love more money, of course. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I would like to add to what John said and say that, yeah, absolutely resourcing is a problem. And, you know, budget today, definitely an issue. But again, you have to think of the scalability issue, you know, even if you can get a 10% bump in your budget or whatever it might be, it, you know, when you look at the amount of data that you're, you're actually trying to process into the future, three, five years out, there's going to be no budget that can handle exactly. that. Exactly. Right. You really cannot continue to carry out business as usual in this regime. You really need to seek different solutions. So do you to use this big data on big data? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, how, that's how a you fair question. Your I mean, yeah, how absolutely. You? I mean, one of the projects that we have ongoing now is to just try to understand where all the data are at NASA and right. to use automated um, data analytics techniques to basically classify and tag that information. That alone would be a big win. Right. Uh, we could use that information to help formulate our strategy for the agency. So that's why I view it as such a critical project. Um, 
just understanding what we right. have is And obviously this is, important. although we've talked about NASA has been involved in data, obviously, analysis for decades, but this is a new way of doing things. It's a new field, so it's your kind of path Finders, I guess, in terms of how things are and where things will be going over the, the next years and decades. Well, I, I, would, I agree with you, although I would hate to characterize it as we're the only ones doing this. I think there's a lot of great expertise here at NASA um, at the various centers, especially uh, I, I, just to call out a few Ames, um, there's a great team out there, uh, JPL, uh, Johnson, and certainly here at Langley, where we are currently sitting. Um, there's a great team yep. that are facing some of these issues. I think one of the problems, one of the, one of the few things that we have as an advantage over these uh, these teams is that all of them are scoped at a mission or a center level, and so it's a little bit of a silo. Whereas mm -hmm. sitting where we're sitting, we are scoped at the agency level, so we're allowed to actually, if you will, to look a little bit larger and broader. And so uh, what we're trying to do is essentially engage these great teams uh, at the missions and centers and bring them in to the sort of let's tackle the problems on an agency level and maybe resource those problems for an agency level, whereas the resourcing is not there currently to, to tackle agency-wide problems. Right. But or I think we can all... Integration and collaboration. Absolutely. So. I mean, uh, I have, when I was uh, working at Goddard, I mean, we, we saw these problems then. We, we, we knew they existed, but we were unable to actually tackle them because rightly so, our management basically said, you're, you're not allowed to look larger than your current mm -hmm. scope. We just don't have resourcing for that. So I think the agency is beginning to understand and, and realize that there are agency-wide problems where if we gather our resources together, we can combine our resources in an effective way to find solutions. Right. So there's a, basically there's a NASA formal approach that's gonna be ongoing that's integrated and that, that looks to get people collaboratively involved in terms of where we are and where we're going. Things right, like so yeah, so as, as John mentioned, we have a series of meetings, uh, Big Data, Big Think. Uh, John runs a big data group. We have the NIAM site. We're reaching out in terms with the Data Fellows Program and also we're going out to the centers and the missions to talk to them, actually really listen and understand their challenges, uh, locate the people with the expertise try to bring them together to, and, and understand how they see the problems. And once we come to at least some consensus on that, resource those problems, uh, solutions to those problems. Right. And so this sounds like a good, good question that we just got um, uh, from the viewers, uh, kind of geared towards John, although obviously you can both can answer. What are some of the current agenda topics that the NASA Big Data Group is working on? And so the you know, question is obviously geared towards, are there certain things that are highest priorities that, that your, your big data group is focused on right now? So we're, we're uh, finalizing the agenda for the next Big Data Big Think. And uh, some of the topics are, uh, we're, we're looking at the, great, the latest and greatest tools. You know, what new tools come out that, that we haven't seen before and how could that apply to NASA? Um, uh, let me think of some of the other topics that are on there. Um, we're, we are bringing in a couple of people from industry, and uh, uh, actually it's um, professors from different um, uh, colleges in the area, um, up in Boston even, uh, bringing in some of them and to talk about the latest that they're hearing about. Um, uh, we're going to break off into some teams and do some strategy. So that's, that's something that we got all these great people together. It's a, a perfect time for us to sit there and, and strategize on uh, what we should be doing for the future. And then... Uh, one of the specific topics that, I, that uh, I sent out and asked everybody is, please bring us your challenges. What, what's your greatest challenge right now? And let's see how that uh, applies across uh, other mission directorates and mission projects and, uh, and center issues that they're seeing so that we can really have a little breakout session and talk about that and, and maybe get to some solution where uh, a center or a mission director over here has, has an answer that they can, or even resources that they can apply to help, right. you know, for the greater good of NASA. Yeah, I completely agree with John. I think, you know, we, we have great expertise already. We can leverage expertise in industry. I think the real challenge uh, at this level is trying to locate that expertise, match it up with the right resourcing that may or may not already be there, and uh, try to tackle the, you know, the problems that NASA as a community agree are the most pressing ones. I think we, 
one thing that we can serve to do is to help organize and provide um, a forum where we can, as an agency, gain the insight of what action needs to be taken. Right. And one of the questions that, that touches on this is, do you see certain areas that are the biggest challenges or the biggest issues in terms of this? I can't put my finger on one right now. Um, you know, Things it varies by, the, by the project. Well, okay. Well, certainly uh, there's a lot of discussion around technology and technology solutions. And okay. certainly a lot of people, myself included, believe that the cloud can serve as a great platform to, to solving these solutions. So I think that definitely is sort of a common theme, if you will. Uh, HPC processing is a long-term one. Um, so uh, there are definite technology thrusts that I think people seem to congregate towards. I, I would hate to prescribe that right. as a solution to mm -hmm. a problem that's not yet formulated, but definitely are, these are themes that tend to come up again and again. You mentioned the cloud. That's another area of what is it and how does that, how does it impact our work? Could you take maybe just a brief amount of time? What is the cloud and how, how will NASA be benefiting from it now or in the future? You, you want me to? Uh, I'll just uh, start off with, um, you know, we, we set up a lab down at Johnson called the, the IoT lab, and it's the Internet of Things lab. Internet and of Things. Internet of Things, and it's a, just, a, just a myriad of devices that are coming, and they're predicting that's going to uh, really impact the networks, the Internet, the cloud. Um, all, this, all those devices want to communicate back, okay. and it's very valuable information, uh, but there's security implications. Is that going on your internal network? Is it on? Is it riding through to the internet to deliver that data? Um, you know, are 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 the products updated software-wise so that they can't be hacked? Um, and you know, a lot of those want to go back out and talk to wherever they've set up in the cloud. So there's there's a lot of complex uh, complexity that we've got to solve and figure out. And that's why this lab down there. I just I took a tour of it a couple weeks ago and. Um, you know, we've got 16 devices that we're looking at right now. Some of those devices are very chatty and want to send a lot of data, um, which adds to the big right. data problem that we're having or we're going to have, and it's only going to get worse. Yeah, so that's another key, key area that lends uh, probably excitement and possibility, but also concerns about how do you, a lot of how benefit. you deal with that. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd, I'd also like to chime in and say that the cloud, certainly in, in my and uh, and some others' uh, vision of how we might be doing science in the 21st century is a definitely a, an enabling technology. It allows us to, as an agency, transparently share files you know, across the agency. But furthermore, it has great implications for understanding our data, uh, not only in terms of things that I've already mentioned, but you can imagine in terms of things such as security. So uh, secure pe security people are definitely interested in being able to make sure that mm -hmm. The right information is getting to the right people. And so right. that's also another win by using this sort of technology. Right. Yeah, that's obviously a key key area. Uh, we have uh, a lot of questions that are coming <laughs> in. So this is, I guess this is a, it's a, it's a hot topic. Um, this gets into kind of the culture, culture issue. And uh, one of the viewers said that, Brian, you mentioned, or I mentioned that you had spent some of your time at Goddard and that you had a sense, therefore, of the culture. And the question here is, how does NASA's culture support and facilitate the work that both of you are trying to do? And how does it get in the way? So this is the culture issue of which we're all aware of, and uh, yeah. it's a key driver. How does, it, how does it help, and how does it hurt? I think, so NASA, as everybody knows, is very mission-focused. And so I'll start with the help part, which will illustrate the, the hurt part. So the great thing about NASA is it's mission focused. So as an agency, we tend to portion out our resources and drill, drill, drill down on a problem and get it done. And that's how we can do so many amazing things, uh, I think. The negative side of this, however, is that when you have that very strong mission focus, you lose the agency focus or you lose the cross mission focus, right? So that's the, that winds up being the challenge. And so and culturally, the part of the culture that allows us to do amazing things on a mission by mission basis is, in my opinion, also the thing which is culturally holding us back from more integrated solutions. So it's a challenge because you don't want to lose the ability to do these amazing things on each mission, 
But, and we all can recognize that if we were better integrated, if we sought these more integrated solutions, we could do even better things. But you don't want to lose what's already good. So you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's how I would frame it. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because uh, what folks will say is that anyone's strength uh, obviously also becomes the, the, the challenges. And certainly within NASA, there's a tremendous focus on the mission and on the project and on the work. And you're offering things and tools and possibilities that are attractive so people will have energy to go towards that. At the same time, there's a tendency to focus in in terms of this is my stuff and this is my approach. And, and uh, what are you trying to do, you know, particularly being at headquarters to, you know. And to, I, to yeah, just, yeah. I, I don't want to get stuck in the business of saying negative things about NASA, but I, I think there's another aspect to the siloing and, and the mission, right. mission focus is that, you know, missions have a finite lifetime. Yeah. The thing that is essentially a tragedy to me is, you know, we spend a lot of resources, we do amazing things, we get this great data, and then there's not a, as good a plan as there should be for what happens to the data. Or, you know, you're in the right. knowledge management business, so the question is, which data do we hang on to? Because right. there's always a resource cost. You, you would like to say everything, right? But there are resource costs associated with that. And yeah. so being able to make an intelligent um, decision about that I am sh is, is difficult. Yeah. And, and once that's done, you know, what, what is the, there, there is no mission necessarily for, uh, currently at NASA, for old data. Where does it go to live? Right now it's sort of, a, it, as I see it, and I'm happy to be corrected, I'm sure there are people out there gnashing their teeth, but it, it seems to be a, a less than formal business where you know it sort of gets handed off to the next mission that's coming up, and they'll support that data. And I'm thinking of, in this case, say, the Hubble Space Telescope and JWST. You know, the, the Hubble archive is not going away. The same great people that did Hubble and are going to do JWST are going to continue to maintain and support that data. Yeah. Right. Well, you mentioned it from a cost. There's also the human capacity. Right. One of the things uh, I'm very aware of is the fact that people feel overloaded. There's so much, and until you get a sense of what is critical in terms of knowledge, in terms of the data, and what are priorities, then you're, you're kind of all over the place. So, so partly that, that gets into that. I don't know if you want to chime in anything in terms of perceptions well, of the... Well, you mentioned you know, the, uh, the uh, NASA culture, and, yeah. and my, my first project was the Enterprise Service Desk when I first came in. Right. Remember I told you before that right. I... I'd run six help desks, so I came in and, and uh, thought it was a slam dunk easy win. You're going to close all these help desks and, and just have one, right. which <laughs> has a lot of benefit. Uh, but but the, you know, the culture is, is um, just like you'd expect anywhere uh, in, in with human nature is to maybe resist the change a little bit. Yep. And uh, I, I came across that, but uh, I worked through and showed the benefit. And um, you know, it had its uh, ups and downs at the very beginning. But I would think most people would agree that when you call the help desk now, you, you got the one number, right. you get through, um, and you're, you're going to get the benefit you want. And, and to be honest, the, I've seen the metrics on it, and the metrics across the board from all the centers is, you know, are, are mostly green. So it's showing that, you know, after all these years, the, the, the benefit's finally there. Right. Yeah, so we're talking about the two Cs. We started with the culture, but you also mentioned change, exactly. which, is, which is hard because if people are, they've been successful. They've been, been doing things the way that that makes sense. And how do you get a change that's an improvement? Do you have any tips in terms of, I mean, you're managing tough stuff, enterprise, and things that people feel, feel strong about. Are there, there are one or two things you always try to, try to do in terms of when you're trying to go in a direction? Do you yes. look for small wins? Do you look for anything? You I, I've got a few, but. Um, As an Air Force guy, you probably have a lot of different. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, really? Stakeholder involvement at the very beginning is, is critical. If you miss that, if you're not looking at the security aspects and bringing in the secu security community, right. if you're not bringing in uh, mission directorate community, um, you know, and, and the center subject matter experts, then there's a lot of expertise out there. So if you're not bringing all that in at the, at the beginning uh, to help guide you, then, then you're going to miss out. And guess what? It's going to take longer, right. probably cost more, and in the end, the product that you uh, develop, come out with, might not be uh, what everybody wants. Uh, and you might have to then immediately go in and, and have a, a phase two or a phase three or a phase four. Right. The relationships, stakeholder mapping, working the, 
yes. the, uh, and certainly not going the way I've heard sometimes people say, oh, I want to make this happen, so I won't tell anybody until I release it, and <laughs> that's always the, the kiss of yeah, death. And so. it's a surprise, and yeah. there, there's a problem. Yeah, people don't like surprises. Uh, here's another question uh, that's uh, for either who want to take it. Uh, in your opinion, how many different data sources are needed to constitute a wide variety of data? And is there a general rule of thumb for each type of project? So is there a, um, how much different data sources are needed to constitute a wide variety of, of data? Right. I am, maybe that's hitting on the, the V, uh, one of right. the three Vs, uh, variety. Yeah. Um, it doesn't take, you know, you can have two different sources or you can have a, a multitude of them. Uh, and, and the tools that are out there now can really ingest a lot of the, the different formats. So it's, it's, it's a night and day difference from a, a few years ago. Um, I don't know if there's uh, anything specific you, th you can think of. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it really winds up being case by case. Uh, okay. Certainly, it starts, it has with, to be it starts with two. Uh, <laughs> it may not okay. necessarily be two. And okay. it could get, it's, it really comes down to resourcing. You know, how much time does it take for a human to do this activity versus trying to choose a more automated approach? And that's really the dividing line. It's a little bit squishy, though. Right. It really depends on the problem that, that's in front of you. Okay. Here's a uh, follow-up somewhat to the security issues that, that, that you have to deal with, we have to deal with. There have been so many huge hacks recently. Does NASA pay close attention to these kinds of hacks and what is being done around our big data to protect it? So everyone's aware of the security issues, break-ins, uh, the hacks that have taken place. Um, how do you go about learning from that, and, and what what do you do to protect uh, the data? That's a great question, and, and for me, that's always on the front of my mind on on that because yes, NASA, uh, we are looking at all the hacks that go on outside of NASA. We have a security division, right. and I, I, I work with and talk to those folks all the time. Very talented people. Lots of projects they're working to to improve the security at NASA. Um, I don't, I don't know if there's any, anything you want to add. Um, I would start by saying that I'm, this is out of my domain, really. But I would, I would agree that you know, we could probably do better with our infrastructure so that it would improve our security in a more organic way. Right now, the way in which our data are stored, uh, there's no uniform methodology necessarily. Um, I would hate to characterize how we approach security across NASA. I don't really right. know. But I, I, my sense is that, you know, by engaging the community and understanding the problems and working with them, we can develop a better infrastructure that makes it a lot easier to secure our data. Right. And it's obvious, obviously it's first on your mind because when I asked the question on change, the first stakeholder group you said was security. Yes. And so it, it's obviously it's a, it's a key issue. Uh, it's come up several times in terms of considerations, and it's something that, uh, that's obviously being worked at an agency level. You know, with, I'm sure the different and, and you have, I mean, we rely on the security community to help uh, in every way they can too. Uh, the, a lot of the processing that's done is internal to NASA, so it's inside our network anyways. Right. Uh, there are projects, of course, that rely on um, computing facilities outside of NASA, and and there's right. got to have a security, a, a good, strong security plan to make sure that every aspect's taken care of: transmission of the data, storage of the data. And um, one of the, the questions that came in is, what organizations, uh, could be industry, could be government, universities, what organizations or federal agencies are leaders in the big data discussion or conversation? Uh, are there certain places that are known for, for being particularly good that, that you, you look at, that you work with? I'll just mention a, a couple that I've heard of uh, and even recently. There is a big data federal working group. Uh, okay. I joined that and I, right. and I listen in. Uh, who are the big players usually in that area? Uh, D Department of Energy, NASA, of course. Uh, the DOD has lots of data that they're tackling too. DHS is another one. So those are the, the four that I can think of right off the top of the bat that are probably uh, at the top, if not leading. Okay. And here's a uh, question. Actually, the person uh, mentions uh, it's Peggy Wehrman, who's online. She says, you mentioned a drill down tool for the EVA example. Yep. Is SharePoint an example that was used? And parenthetical also from Anita, uh, looks like call, 
uh, what EVA tool is being developed and what's the name of it. So this is about the drill down tool for EVA, a SharePoint an example that was used and uh, you know, what's the EVA tool that was, was developed? So, so uh, I'll just uh, throw out a couple answers there. Uh, number one, SharePoint, uh, you know, we have SharePoint uh, at every center. Uh, there's some very specific mission SharePoints and then there's some generic ones that are at each center. Um, but in, that, in this particular tool, uh, SharePoint isn't the, uh, the main back, back end frame right. that's being used. Um, if, if folks want to know more about that, I, I encourage them to go to the NIAM website, okay. niam.nasa.gov, and, and check it out. Um, there's, there's lots of little information about that. There'll be more information as uh, phase one ends at the end of this month uh, for the EVA project, and then they get into phase two where they're they, uh, uh, expanding it out to um, the, in the entire suite that they're going to be uh, looking at and working on. Right. So. Okay. Very good. Um, one of the things, I get back to some of the things that uh, we're also, I wanted to make sure we, we covered. And one of the issues is obviously the whole issue of roles and responsibilities uh, from the standpoint of we have NASA capability uh, internally working big data. Uh, there's also benefits from, from how we contract out and bring and partner uh, issues of big data. What are your thoughts of, of, of that, of what NASA's role is internally? in terms of working big data, and how do you go about uh, contracting it, and how do you partner uh, with, uh, with different organizations? Do you want me to take that? Or um, so um, one of the areas uh, that we were working on was Google Apps, and we'll talk yep. about that a little bit. But um, you know, we're, we're working with uh, uh, companies out there and partnering with them all the time. Uh, an example is right here at Langley, uh, the IBM Watson project okay. and uh, there's there's three projects that they're working right now and uh, they've got some very talented folks here that that brought that talent in and, and partnered and uh, we're all going to benefit from that um, some of the things that they're working on is the carbon uh, nanotube uh, and what they're doing is they're going out to all the scientific publications out there and the tool ingests all that and then it tries to form formulate some some opinions more or less uh, as as you've probably heard of with the IBM Watson how, how that works. Um, some of the other areas, they're doing solar radiation and then uh, autonomous uh, air flight, uh, aircraft uh, control is the other one. So those are the three that they're doing. That's just here, uh, what's going on just here locally. Wow. So there's a lot a, that's going on. There's a lot and it's amazing and, and I'm just, every time I hear about these kind of projects, I get really excited. Yeah, I mean, there's so much going on and, and we've just touched uh, a few things and you're, you're you're starting. I'm ready to come on board. Just, um, You're hired. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, one of the, the, uh, the issues that we've talked around in the knowledge community is obviously the importance of finding yes. data and issues. And the use of visualization, uh, because so much of our data is in, in, in terms of lessons or in terms of uh, what do you need to know about in terms of uh, engineering or projects are written down. And people want video, but they, they often want a visualization. What can you tell us, uh, I'll go to Brian, about the importance of visualization in big data? Well, visualization is critical. Um, really, visualization gives you, at a high level, two things. First of all, as the investigator of the data, it provides you a, a nice way of looking at the data and, and easily, if it's done right, being able to find those sort of outliers which are where your next generation science may lie. And visualization is also important in terms of outreach. You know, you're, you're trying to tell a story with very complex data set or very large data set. It, it's, it's not easy for people to get a hold of that and wrap their mind around it if you're just sort of talking about it. I, I'm sure that there are great speakers out there, but when you have a very good visualization or a set of graphs which can tie it together, then you can tell your story that much better. I mean, right. So, Absolutely critical. The energy, the ability to see it, and also yeah. we see young professionals expect that. Yeah. You know, they want it that way. Kind Always of. pushing on us. Yeah. <laughs> These young people. But it's good to have hard customers. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't do this sort of thing because I find it to be trivial or you know, where the excitement is for me is because it's challenging and these are not easily solved problems and working with really uh, bright people to help solve these challenges, that's uh, that's what gets me up in the morning. 
And uh, one of the things that we have so many questions, we're going to go 15 minutes longer. We'll keep going another 15 minutes with your, with your okay. Sure. And um, but there's a lot of lot of energy and there's a lot of questions there. So just let our sponsors know we're going long. I always wanted to say that. Um, we have a, a a question here in terms uh, from Chris Miller, uh, online. Uh, what other big data tools does NASA use for collection and analysis? Uh, In-house software, commercial software, and an um, example of uh, Hadoop, it looks like. Hadoop, okay. yeah. Yeah, okay. That's so what I'm, other tools what are, you know, do you use for collection and analysis and in in-house software and commercial software? So I, I love to, to say that uh, we probably have just about everything. And if there's a chart online that you can go find that, that shows the whole universe for big data, right. and, and the fine print is, is about that big. I mean, it's literally all the different companies, all the different um, software tools. It's, it's amazing. Uh, we use Hadoop. We use, we use all, almost, I can think of you know, uh, uh, just a ton of different tools that we use. I, I, w I wouldn't limit it. Um, right. if, if somebody brought up a tool, I'd say, I haven't heard of that one, but uh, if I brought it up to the working group, but some, somebody would raise their hand and say, yeah, we use that. There's so many different aspects. Some tools are so good at what they do that you really want to, you, you go to that one tool for some specific problem, but then you use five other tools for other problems. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, John. And I, I would add to that, that you know, not only can you find everything here, but what the real challenge is is not that NASA is leaving a tool by the wayside. The real challenge is where is the expertise and the people who are using those tools and getting them to the people that actually need that expertise. That's, that's the real challenge. Um, you know, we, we have experts who do data mining with uh, Python, with R, with various tool sets that they may have brought up themselves. And the, I, I tend to view software um, I try to be pragmatic about it. I, I view it as sort of like a, a bag of golf clubs. You know, you're, you're playing this game, and where you are at the moment on the course demands a certain club. So you pull that club and you use it. You, you don't use your putter to go long, but right. that putter is going to be very critical at the end of the, the day when you get finally to the hole. So right tool for the right job. Um, these things all have their strengths and weaknesses, and across the agency, we, are, you know, we have great people that are aware of these strengths and weaknesses. What we really have as a challenge is trying to get these people to the problems and vice versa. The people who have the problems, well, where are those people? Yeah, so the tools are out there using just about everything. And yes. I guess one of the issues is how do people learn about this and how do, they, how do they become? Do you have to be within the big data community, the information technology community, to, to have a say or to, to get a part of this? It's, I mean, there's a lot of energy. Well, well, sir, this, how would people find out about it? Right. So again, the, the NIAM website right. that we have um, is supposed to help facilitate that, okay. to bring people together. And we've been working with members of the knowledge management community to try to um, develop a means of visualization and smart searching for experts across NASA. This is a project we're trying to bring on with, is that with David, with David and Manjula. Yeah, uh, with David Mezes at, at uh, okay. Johnson. And certainly, we'd be looking to collaborate with others to make this a reality. Um, so this is something that we're beginning to push on. Yeah, no, it's vital. It's vital, you know, for us in terms of, uh, you know, basically knowledge for us is about the missions, programs, projects, engineering, and particularly it's about how do people learn, uh, how do we share, and how do we find what we need to solve the problems, and also to share the innovations. And so, if we can't find these things, if there's an enterprise solution, then uh, then you can't be successful. So that's that's an important issue. And join, and join a working group too. I mean, you, yeah. you'll hear the problems and you'll hear the tools that are being used. You'll meet the people. Right. About the relationships, knowing and then having that kind of an impact. Um, here's a question from Ryan. Uh, it's specific. It's about um, the use of real-time data. It says, how could astronaut biometrics data be made more open to researchers? I don't know if this is either of your areas, but how can biometrics data about astronauts be made more open to researchers? It's extremely difficult to obtain real-time data unless you work at Johnson. <laughs> so this is probably a, a question for Johnson, that, but that's that's a but great question. Here, so. It's a very hard problem because yeah. you got privacy uh, information there about right. a specific astronaut, and how do you share that, and, and should you share it? So 
that's not a, a question that's uh, easily answered. Um, you know, and it's not just our data for our you know, biometrics that we collect. There's other, sea, there, there's other spacefaring nations out there too. And, and you know, it'd be great if we all had that information. Right. It could uh, probably mine all kinds of gold nuggets from that. You want to take a, any thoughts on that or not really? <laughs> it, it's obviously, it's a larger issue because yeah, it gets one. into individual protections uh, as well as you know other factors. Yeah. So, but I assume that's probably one of the things that's, that's well, other things that are being looked at. I, about all I could say on that is that uh, we have been collaborating with others in the CIO's office and beyond to try to find an automated means of understanding when there's too much personal information that uh, obviously that the level of classification of this document needs to be higher. So we have an interest in that and maybe it could be applied in this case so that we could, we could run these tools on the astronaut data and if they're not sufficiently scrubbed of personal information then this tool would give us a heads up that that's the case and then we could step back make another attempt and then uh, really what I'm getting at here is having an, an agency-wide but automated way of validating data sets that go public right. I mean, making sure that we're uniformly applying our standards this is very difficult to do now and it, essentially human beings do this we're all imperfect I certainly am and so that that's part of the problem I think that, that you know NASA rightly so hangs on to its data a little more strongly than it might otherwise policy dictate because we need to be very careful and we, do, we want to account for the human error which can occur. If we had a more automated solution then perhaps we could be a little more liberal with how we hand out information because we could be sure that information is sufficiently scrubbed and at the level of classification that it should be at. Right. Well one of the things that comes through in our discussion is um, it's a vital Feel. I see why you're, you're, you're enjoying it, why there's a lot of energy there, there's a lot of meeting, because you're, you're on something that is, that, that's developing. You know, the answers haven't been all established. You, you can't go to, here, let's pull the book and here's how you, you do it. So these are things that have to be discussed and collaborated on and work with stakeholders and, and moving forward. So there's an energy there uh, in terms of it. And I wanted to throw out that we, uh, we, just in general, we put out a lot of data to the public. Uh, open.nasa.gov, opendata.nasa.gov. Um, there's just so much data sets that we put out for the public to go uh, work on. And uh, I, th I thought we mentioned earlier the open, uh, the uh, space apps challenge is another area where we just make that available and have the, the public go and once a year at least, uh, look at the data and try to make sense of it and, and come up with some new things that we haven't thought of. And then we bring that back because it's, it's all open source. Yeah. So, yeah, no, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a great point, John. Uh, and we're, we're really failing to give a, a few important uh, no, uh, shout outs here, as it were, to the other members of the team, uh, yep. Beth Beck and her team, who are supporting the open innovation thrust of the open data, and Jason Dooley. And also, in terms of the data strategy, um, Nick Skitland, who's on the data team, and has a really good appreciation of a large number of these problems, and was a prime motivator for trying to get an agency-wide white paper, which is also on the NIAM site. And to get back to John's point about the Space Apps Challenge, that's really a great way, in my opinion, to also engage the community and get solutions. I know we often think to industry, large commercial entities, to find that sort of next generation of solution, but the reality is that we can also find it from academia and young folks who have got great ideas, great energy, and it is a, a point in fact, we have adopted a solution from the winners of the Space Apps Treasure Challenge in 2015, Data I think it was, came up with a great tagging solution and document classification solution, uh, which is very highly performant, uh, very fast. And so we've adopted that solution into some work that we're doing now in our office. So I think, you know, absolutely trying to engage young folks uh, who are already excited about this, who have got great ideas and great approaches is another very strong means of whereby we can solve these challenges. So I want, I'm getting a signal that we have uh, two minutes even though we, we landed into so, so many questions here. One of the things that comes clear is there's a lot of collaboration that's going on. Uh, there's the big data group, there are different fellows that, that you work with, you work across the center, the mission directorate. So 
there's a lot of uh, these issues that, that are taking place. Um, final question I wanted to close, and I mentioned this at the beginning. This is such a, in some ways, a new field. Uh, and I don't think there would have been your titles uh, perhaps 10 years ago, maybe five years ago. How does someone who's starting out, how does a young professional in particular, how does a student who says, hey, I want to be doing this kind of stuff, they, 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 they seem cool guys, they seem like they're doing fun stuff, I want to do that. How do you uh, get involved in this? Are there certain courses, there are certain competencies, uh, are there certain things that you need to do to get involved in big data? So, so I'll just throw out real quick uh, some of the things that I've seen uh, in other folks that are, that are at my level and, and uh, how I got here. Go out there and become very technical in the area that you're interested in. Uh, use that, right. that information, that, uh, that new skill, and uh, go off and, and really, as Brian mentioned earlier, tackle those really challenging projects. That's an area that, that you'll, you'll, you'll learn more and uh, you'll build your reputation up to the point where then you get uh, an offer from, from NASA or, or any other uh, you know, well-known, well-respected. technical skills. Yeah, yeah, the skills are where it's at, I, I believe, because okay. that gets you in the door. Okay. Well, I, I think John is, is correct. I would also add that um, sort of the competencies that are often looked for in data science are an ability to use statistics and machine learning to model and understand the data, uh, an ability to, I can't think of the technical term, but I'll say munge, to, to combine data sets um, that might be described differently, to work with databases uh, and whatnot. Uh, this is great. And then often what's called out, and I, I forget who said this, but it's a certain X factor. It's, you know, an ability to, as John said, take on the hard problem, you know, not shy away from it, not worry about how you don't know how to solve it immediately, but also think creatively about solving it. You know, maybe something off the shelf is not going to work, but I'm familiar with something that's, well, it's not even similar, but gee, it looks like it might work. Let's try it, you know. That would, in my opinion, make a great data scientist, and that's the kind of people that I certainly would be looking for to be on my team to solve problems. Uh, and, and also be great programmers. Right. You've, you've got to be a programmer. Yes. I want to thank uh, John and Brian. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I feel like we've covered so much, but I also feel like we've been at the very top sur uh, surface. But you can tell by all the questions uh, that uh, we haven't been able to touch. Any questions that are coming in that we have, we'll answer uh, on certainly the km.nasa.gov site and other, other sources. Hopefully, maybe this could be a continuing. Maybe we can do you know, some more. Uh, focused sure. on different aspects of big data, but it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Uh, in addition to John and Brian, want to thank uh, our partner. This is a partnership we've been looking for for a while, uh, and certainly Deborah Diaz, NASA Chief Technology Officer for IT, has been a key part of that. So we, we finally got started, uh, pulled this off. Thank you, uh, Deborah. Uh, one of the things also that happened is we had to change our location. We originally we were going to be at headquarters. And then uh, we had the Pope's visit, and so we came to Langley Research Center, and uh, no one, I certainly had no concerns. This, the folks who work here at NASA Engineering Safety Center and the, the, the video uh, crew are the best. Uh, it's just a tremendous location and site. And so I want to thank uh, Daniel Hoffpower, uh, Na Pham, Ian Bachelder, and everyone else who really helped uh, make this event happen. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to come here. Everything goes smooth. You don't worry there's, there's water here everything is everything is perfect and I uh, want to thank also Susan Snyder and Mark Schwartz for putting this thing together and thanks to you for being here with us uh, and just keep learning thank you very much